You're listening to the B&H Photography Podcast. For over 40 years, B&H has been the professional source for photography, video, audio, and more. For your favorite gear, news, and reviews, visit us at bnh.com or download the B&H app to your iPhone or Android device. Now here's your host, Alan Weitz. Greetings and welcome to the B&H Photography Podcast. Now that I've grabbed your attention, let me remind you that if you haven't already subscribed to our show, do so. Simply head over to iTunes, write B and HPP, that's B ampersand HPP, into the search box. Click on the icon, download the app, and you're good to go with close to 100 episodes on tap. And it's free. Keep in mind that subscribing to our show is the best way to support it. Those of you who are already subscribers, we thank you. And those of you who aren't, we thank you in advance. Today, we're going to be talking about hip-hop photography. And to keep the conversation on track, we have not one, not two, not three, but four guests joining us today. Vicki Toback is a journalist and former CNN producer who currently writes and produces for Complex, Mass Appeal, and The Fader. Vicky is the author of Contact High, Hip Hop Photography Plus Visual Culture. Jeanette Beckman began her career at the dawn of punk rock for the Face and Melody Maker magazines, photographing The Clash, Boy George, and ultimately three police album covers. Moving to New York in 1982, she was drawn to the underground hip-hop scene and photographed pioneers such as Run DMC, Slick Rick, Salt and Pepper, Big Daddy Kane, KRS-One, and many, many others. Jeanette has published four books, and her photographs are in the permanent collections of the Smithsonian Museum and the Museum of the City of New York. Danny Hastings, a Panamanian Mexican photographer, initially moved to New York City to study engineering, but wouldn't you know it, he fell in love with photography, kissed his plumb line goodbye, bought himself a camera, and has since shot more than 150 album covers. Danny's most notable work includes Enter the Wu-Tang, 36 Chambers, Big Pun's Capital Punishment, and Nas I Am, among others. He also gets credit for directing the feature film The Love Potion. Eric Johnson was born in Newark, New Jersey. He came of age as a photographer in the New York club scene. He's created iconic hip-hop images of Notorious B.I.G., Lauryn Hill, Dipset, Lil Wayne, as well as newer artists like G. Herbo and Cakes Da Killa. Eric's work stretches across music genre that includes Lady Gaga, Bruno Mars, and Maxwell, and he helms Upstairs at Eric's, a loft space in Manhattan that is equal parts studio, gallery, disco, lounge, and design studio. Also, let's be clear, none of our guests should be defined solely for their work in hip-hop photography. Each of our guests has established themselves in the world of editorial and advertising photography. Hip-hop is just part of their story, albeit an important one. Okay, let's start with Vicky. Vicky, tell us about Contact High. How is the project born? Where is it now? And what's the goal going forward? Yeah, well, thank you so much for having us. Contact High, you know, as you mentioned, I'm um, a journalist. And before that, in a previous life, worked in the music business, um, worked with Gangstar and some other artists. And so when I started writing about music, I naturally just started thinking about how the role photography has played in, in music as well. And Fast forward to about two years ago, I was flipping through the Magnum Contact Sheets book and started thinking about all the hip-hop shoots that I've been on as a publicist and as a journalist as well, and was like, I would really love to see some of the outtakes of of hip-hop photography. Um, And beyond that, too, you know, I I said it's important to... start looking and start archiving and start celebrating the work of this great group of shooters that have been doing the work for so long. And I was just curious, you know, what made them point their camera at these very early, you know, roots of of this music that was once considered a subculture. So I started doing um, interviews, you know, one by one. Um, I started it as a column for Mass Appeal, and Jeanette was actually the first with her Slick Rick. Um, And, you know, just asking questions like, what did you shoot this with? Um, How did you decide on the ultimate shot? What was happening in your life at the time? What was happening in the life of the artist at the time? What was happening in the life of hip hop at the time? Um, And, you know, having done now um, several of these interviews and and working on this project as a book and an exhibition, um, it really tells, you know, this this big narrative that I think it's time to tell. How... uh 
How far along are you in the project and when do you expect the book to come out? I'm actually in the very final stages. I'm probably going to bug the three of these guys for their photos right after we finish this podcast. <laughs> <Me too. laughs> you mean I've, you haven't asked them yet? Right. No. <laughs> <laughs> the high res, the high res. <laughs> um, so, um, and it'll be out fall 2018. Yeah. And it's a big honor to have all three of these guys in there with their great stories, which I hope they'll tell here today too. Mm-hmm. Actually, I have one question uh, for you and we have a bunch for, for the photographers, but did you, uh, how did you, define hip-hop was there a did you kind of have to say okay i'm sorry this artist doesn't quite make the cut as hip-hop but even though we love the photos or or their their work changed over the years did you have issues and discussions on this i think it was a it was a combination of factors um i mean for me it it's more of just like a gut instinct but yeah i mean the criteria is it has to be a good photo you know it has to have a reason for being there in the story arc of hip hop. Um, it has to be a photographer who not just took one shot, but really, you know, is dead was dedicated to shooting hip hop. And it has to be something that maybe is like etched in the the memory of of hip hop fans right. or people who love hip hop. So yeah, it was like a combination of so one photo of factors. one photo on that contact sheet is an iconic shot and the rest or alternate takes from that. That's kind of the idea. Yeah. Well, yeah. 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 And yeah, it's yeah, a way, you know, kind of see into the mind of the photographer, like see how they think about sequencing and, you know, working with the artist. Like I always ask, like, did the artist have any idea of how they wanted to be portrayed and what was that like? And um, it's just a way of like seeing into their mind. And, um, you know, I think that's such a fascinating part of it that really gets lost sometimes. I liked, I, I, I thought it was cool how you could kind of see some of the vulnerability that you may not have seen or some of the humor. Like the the shot of Biggie comes to mind with the crown. It's like they had the outtakes of with him smiling and, and kind of making funny faces. I thought that was kind of a cool moment that you, you weren't used to seeing him portrayed that way. Yeah, well, it also tells the story of like how choices are made in media and people who control imagery and how, you know, certain choices that get made then tell this story um, to the public. But yeah, you ask people um, who knew Biggie personally and, you know, they see the smiling photo of him and they're like, that's the Biggie that we knew. I, and a lot of these photos are taken for some for album covers, others for magazine shoots, I'm sure, and, and maybe a variation. But to the photographers, did uh, did you have final choice on a lot of these photos that we're seeing now? Or was it a combination of record labels and artists and everything? Not always. I mm-hmm. mean, sometimes you do a shoot and you think that's the shot and then, you know, the art director or the record company would choose something completely different. And then, but, you know, being a photographer... You have shows and you can show the other images, which is so great. You know, now you can put them up on social media and websites and people can share those. And, and I, you have copyright for most of the photos that we're talking about? Or? I think, I'm not sure you guys correct me, but I think the law is if you took the photo, you own the copyright. It belongs to you from the moment you go click. Right. As long as you Unless didn't you sign. sign it yeah, yeah yes. as long as you didn't sign yeah, it away to the record you don't have company. A, yeah, right. Yeah. Has anybody here, in, we've been, to, uh, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, in my case, I did a lot of album like 90 percent of my work was album covers so you you do sign a partial buyout which gave the record company to use your photographs obviously for the album cover and all the promotional stuff but you kept merchandising rights and you own and you own the licensing uh, rights yes yes so in the 90s uh record companies were not in the business of merchandising Mm -hmm. you know so they couldn't take your picture, put it on, on, a, on a T-shirt and sell it. That was not part of their business. That was always, you know, my right to handle with the artist, obviously, because, you know, the artist would want to print the T-shirt and sell it. So it will come as an added business right. to, to, to my end. So, Which yes. is actually a question I had uh, for you guys, which is how do you guys feel when you see these images out there, whether they're done you know, with your approval and then uh, a paycheck that may come with it, or as you know... There's a lot of iconic images out there, and then the people who went click are not getting a dime for it. So I I I imagine you see that here, too. You see a lot of people kind of remixing some of these, you know... I don't... I'm not coming across any of my pictures being used like that. The artists from the 90s know the the rules, and I haven't really shot anything new. Record companies right now are trying to get you... uh, full buyout for everything and i'm not 
you know, trying to do that. So, Jeanette, I saw you, you, you make a face in terms of have, you, have <laughs> your pictures been, uh, have you had experience with your... So many of them. Mm, and it's, it's, it's not really the record companies or the artists. Mm. It's, you know, small companies, T-shirt companies. Uh, there's an artist right now that's taken one of my Slick Rick pictures and has made a whole career out of reproducing it mm. and selling it for $15,000. I mm. mean, you know, he's made a screen print of it. And, you know without permission. And I'm fine to collaborate. I collaborate with a lot of mm. artists. I have this series called The Mashup, which I've done with a lot of graffiti artist friends. And, you know, it's a collaboration between a group of friends. But when someone takes your image mm -hmm. and then doesn't own up to it. And then buys lunch on and doesn't invite you. That's right. not good. Exactly. Yeah. You know, and they go, oh, yeah, we got it off uh, the internet. I'm like, <laughs> yeah, but <laughs> doesn't make that it doesn't okay. mean to say but you think, own it. Yeah. And I think it's something that's important to talk about in, in, from a generational perspective because I think um, nowadays it's so like second nature to take things off the internet. It's so disconnected from the artists. A lot of times people will see photos and you know, I, there was an, so I run the Contact High Instagram and um, there was a, there was a photographer, Al Pereira. Um, he has this very famous photo of Biggie and Tupac. And I had asked him for the contact sheet of it. Um, fast forward, you know, I'll skip all the in between, but on that same contact sheet was a photo, the first ever photo of Nas and Tupac. And the internet went, nuts. Yeah, it was everywhere. It was everywhere. Yeah. And it was, you know, it was a great find. It was like very much in spirit of what this project is, is like looking at archives and finding stuff that, you know, may have been lost. And, but I bring it up because, um, all the comments were like, I can't wait to make this into a t-shirt. Like there were like 500 comments on that, on Nas's feed. People were like, yo, I'm rocking this as a t-shirt. And, and I was like, like, <laughs> I kept responding to everyone. I was like, let me just stop. Cause I was like, you know, this is infringement of copyright. I was like the grandma on there. Like you can't, do that but like they weren't doing it in a malicious way there's there's this culture of the precedence has been set already for doing this on yeah. many levels well, they think yeah. it belongs yeah. to the um they think it belongs to the the ether to the world mm -hmm. yeah. so yeah. It's if it's like, on my screen it's mine well yeah just because yeah. so it's like i feel like one of those people that from my generation it's like an entire business just dealing with people who use my stuff illegally it's fans but it's also proper like website, ABC News, all of these crazy places that just use your photos and they kind of act so casual the way that they speak to you as if like this belongs to everyone because I see it over the internet. So somehow luckily enough for me, even though it's like annoying, we were able to flip it. And so that's like a business with just cleaning up the internet and getting your things back. I would never have expected to, I was creating something that would be so valuable later until the internet came along and it was like everywhere. So, but one else, the other thing I want to say is that copyright, getting things copywritten in addition to thinking you own them is very, is very important. It's, it's a very big deal in regards to cleaning that up and being compensated fairly for sure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, I did a search on uh, hip hop tattoos, and there's a lot of, uh, I think, some of your guys' photos. On I actually skin. seen those, sure. yeah. <laughs> but I, I, I love that idea. Yeah, right. I mean, that's an original piece of art, one piece. Right. If somebody right. wants to take one and of my pictures. And if you want to sell your tattoo right. to somebody, okay, right. go for it, you know. Chop right. a leg off. Chuck it off right now. <laughs> no, but you know, if I, somebody wants to take a picture and just use it one time, right. I'm just totally cool, or they want to do a mural with right. my LL Cool J picture, that's fabulous. Mm -hmm. But making a line of t shirts and selling it, that's not. Yeah, that's not cool. And if I could just take a jump back for one second, we're talking about going back over the contact sheets. Um, you have your initial gut reaction the first time you look at it and you go, okay, there's a money shot right there. Um, has anybody here since gone back over sheets and say, you know something, looking back with 2020 vision, mm. that is really the mm -hmm. shot that Always. should have gone. Mm -hmm. Yes, okay. totally. I'm doing it right now. I'm working on a book. And it's kind of, you know, my history from my punk pictures to now. And I'm going back looking at old contact sheets I shot in 1980 and going, oh, my God, this is like an amazing picture. I never saw it. Yeah, it's so cool, right? I have my yeah. very first contact sheet. It's very boring, by the way, but I do have it. You do? <laughs> I do, yeah. It's amazing. 1968. Oh, wow. Mm. Seven. Wow. <laughs> That's cool. I think that leads to a question that I have for, for Jeanette. Can you talk about uh, any parallels that you, you saw between punk and hip-hop? Well, I think there were huge parallels because, 
you know, I grew up in London and I came out of art school and punk was happening all around and it was totally like a kind of street revolution, you know, and it was coming from, you know, what what we call in England working class. You know, you probably call it blue collar or something here, but, you know, as kids expressing themselves for the first time and really going against, you know, the queen and the way the status mm-hmm. quo was and just speaking up and going, this isn't right. And it it was huge. And I followed that. And then I saw my first hip hop show in 1982 and was blown away by Here, that. in the Came, States? or In London. In London it was the right. first hip hop show to ever come to London. Uh-huh, uh-huh. And in that show was... Fab Five Freddy, Africa Bambata, the Rocksteady crew, um, Futura, Dondi, Ramelzy. Like, it was it was an amazing... The Double Dutch Girls. The Double Dutch Girls. <laughs> exactly. It was an amazing show. and We'd never seen anything like it. And then I came here that Christmas and it was all happening. And it was the same thing. Kids, you know, as far as I could see from, you know, poor communities, the Bronx and Harlem and the place was a mess, the economy was bad. Kids were speaking up and talking about their lives and it was a total parallel to me and I was just fascinated did, by did, that. Did you feel a part of the scene? I mean, I guess this is a question for everybody that I wanted to ask. Did, did, you, were you, did you feel like you were part of the scene that you were photographing or did you feel like a documentarian coming in or just an, an artist being hired? You know, I, I probably, being me, didn't really think about it. I was just here kind of in it and I was obsessed by it and everybody I mean it was actually great for me coming from another country because you know I'd go to the Bronx to photograph some you know Africa Bambata and they'd be like you know where are you from you ain't from here and I'd be like no no I'm from London and they're like what are you doing here and we'd have this dialogue and it helped me get to a lot of places that maybe if I was an American I wouldn't have been accepted so easily Interesting. so you know I was you know, I guess I'm always a little separate because I'm not born here, but I feel like I was definitely embedded in it. Danny, <laughs> what about you with, for example, with Wu-Tang Clan? Did, were, were you in the scene? Were you hanging I, out? I, mean, I feel similar to, to her story. I mean, I'm from Panama. Yeah. I was, uh, I, I, I was there until I was like 15. I came when I was 16, uh, 17, and I kind of I became a man here. And I started taking pictures very early. I come from very humble beginnings, you know what I mean? I grew up poor, <laughs> I didn't have a lot, you know, and, and you know, and I sort of, uh, when I came here, I landed in Jackson Heights, mm-hmm. so I okay. became part of the scene, yeah. you know, hip hop was all around me, uh, I was living in the hood, uh, I was taking pictures of all my friends, so yes, um, I was, I was accepted pretty quickly, you know, like I became, all my friends were, you know, black and Latino, um, you know, I, I started loving the music. I, however, I, when I was in Panama, um, little does she know, she was a huge inspiration for me oh, because wow. I was a, I was a fan of uh, rock and roll music before hip hop happened for me. So I was listening to all the Police albums. I was listening to Rush. I was into everything that that was being imported to Panama. Mm-hmm. I had three three of the albums that define my 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 teenage years and one was was uh uh, Sen, uh Senora Bondara yeah. I think you know yep. she shot that and and uh, Outlanders the more I had oh, that yeah. too you know and I was the kind of kid that um will read everything on an album mm. like I will go not just the cover but I will and I will also try to play music I play the guitar so I will try to play Message in a Bottle and I will try to play you know <laughs> every every breath you take and I, I really thought I was going to be a musician we brought a couple of guitars right? in here we'd like yeah, to uh, bring it on <laughs> <laughs> so you know I fast forward into the story I mean like I I I had those albums for five years of my life. Mm. I came Crazy. here and I was, yeah. <laughs> and uh, when I had the shot, the chance to shoot an artist, I, I think, you know, I was very, you know, conceptual in terms of uh, putting albums together and, uh, you know, lighting wise, I was very into my lighting just because, you know, the work that, that, that I had around me before I shot hip hop. And Eric, I want to ask you, did you have, did you look back to earlier types of photography, earlier music photography or anything like that? You know what? It's like so funny. I feel like I don't know what to say because he has my story. Uh, (laughs) No, seriously. When I was, um, when you were asking about like the parallels, it was, now I look back and it's very interesting now, but it's like when I was a teen, 
I would come on the path train from Newark to um, New York City when I was like maybe 14 or 50. And I was obsessed with going to record stores mm -hmm. and bookstores and specifically obsessed with with um, the England punk scene. So mm -hmm. it's like oh, wow. and that was something yeah. that was so not familiar with. You know, being in Newark, it wasn't like, but it was something I was really obsessed with. And it's a, so I just go there and hang out for like hours, like, you know, as a kid, like, and check out a lot of the stuff that Jeanette had done. So it's like that I went from there to hanging out at Sleeping Bag Records when when hip hop did start becoming a thing. And I was listening to to Red Alert and those DJs and somehow I got connected to this girl that... Um, at Sleeping Bag Records and it's like once again it's like I start seeing Jeanette's images everywhere and I'm just trying to get that first gig you know what I'm saying but I would <laughs> hang out there for Jeanette, ever right. so yeah that um, I, don't know. I feel like as far as being more connected I feel like more connected as later in life than to a scene like before I was kind of like um, showing up on shoots and doing them I feel like my style later became more like a point and shoot type thing where I kind of am more like involved in the culture than I was back at that time. Mm -hmm. That's why I don't feel like I have so many personally, so many behind the scenes shots, the way that a lot of the, my heroes, I look at their photos and it gives me like peaks and, you know, I feel like that's totally my style now, but in the beginning. Who are some kinda, of those heroes? Who, uh, who are some of the folks you would think of besides Jeanette, of course? Uh, <laughs> well, I mean, you know, <laughs> I don't know. I mean, to be totally honest, I'm sure it's a lot of people, but somehow because our lives kept like crossing, I know her name, but I didn't really sweat like photographers to know every person that shot those photos that, mm, right. you know what I'm saying? Right. But um, I just happened to came across Jeanette like often enough to be like, okay, I know who she is. Well, Vicky, are, are there any photographers you can think of that maybe started as part of the crew or part of maybe they were a musician and they, they went away from the music to become a photographer that kind of came right out of that scene? Well, I know like J. Rue has really gotten into photography. So mm, I yeah, hear... Yeah, yeah, he's a photographer. Now. He's a photographer. Um, Good I mean, one too. Yeah, he yeah. lives in Berlin mm. now. And, um, yeah. yeah. Um, Ricky. Ricky Powell, yes. Um, I mean, I think... There's there's a lot like, you know, when I interview the artists now and, and from back then, they're more now um, into like archiving the story of the band, like like DJ Premier, like he's like, I really need to gather like a proper archive on Gangstar. Um, you know, they have a big anniversary coming up next year. And so, um, so th the artists, you know, that I talk to are more... Um, interested in like preserving the visual archive of that you know of their of their work um but yeah i mean the only yeah the only artist i can think of that actually well and i mean young guru he's he's a young you know a, a, like a younger shooter but he's someone that's been in the business for a long time um and and is you know starting to take shooting really seriously um yeah that's I can't think of anyone else off the top of my head. I'm sure. I'm sure there are some that I'm just missing. In terms of the the 36 Chambers mm -hmm. album, that, that I mean, that album was when that came out. No one had heard anything like it. I mean, it was so different. It was so esoteric. Yeah. The, the lyrics and the, the all the kung fu samples and all the you know craziness that and and RZA was like the mastermind. Yeah. Of all of that, how how was that a collaborative? Yeah. Thing I mean, with the cover, like what what's the story behind the cover? Extent, yeah, 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 of course. I mean, um, I. Uh, I mean, I, I've never heard anything like that before, and and I wanted to to make sure that I created a visual that that nobody's seen anything like that before in hip hop. You know, like you know, I I was a fan of of like Pink Floyd album covers. You know what I mean? Like you will you will listen to the music and you see like a pig flying in a wall and yeah, like a German looking legs monster thing. You know, and 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 it would just be like wow, like, I want to do that, you know? And when I met with the RZA, he was like, he was kind of telling me about the sound. And I went to the actual studio where they recorded. It was called Firehouse. And it was like a dungeon. It was like, there was holes in the walls, wires was coming out, <laughs> uh, blunt guts all over the place, 40s, smoking. You know, like, it was just like crazy. But I mean, the sound was like, yo, what is this that I'm listening to? Going back, when I got the phone call 
to shoot the Wu Tang Clan. I already did like a couple album covers. I already had um, Return of the Boom Bap with Carrie Swan, and I had RCA as a, as a client already. And I got the phone call, and I was in Atlanta, right? Um, I was. I learned pretty quickly that you had to network to get business. You know, I didn't have a job. I didn't have nine to five. This was my career kind of happening. So I heard that there was a, a hip hop conference in Atlanta. So I'm like, man, I'm going there. I'm going to get some clients. <laughs> so while I was there, uh, I got the phone call from RCA. Uh, and uh, the art director's name is Jackie Murphy, super good friend of mine. And uh, she was like, hey, man, you're going to shoot this group. It's called... Uh, the Wu-Tang Clang, I already heard one song, Protect Your Neck, and Method Man. I was like, oh, man, this is this is awesome. And But I never seen them. And it, coincidentally, they were performing in a new showcase group in that conference that I was. I was like, oh, shit. you know, the Wu-Tang is going to be here, so I'm going to let me go and, and check them out. So, you know, I go with all my boys, you know. I mean, it's the night, so you always rock with, you know, the boys <laughs> everywhere, you know. It's like, let's go and check it out. So we're, we're, um, you know, I'm on stage. Like, I was like, kind of like on stage and and uh, just checking the group out or whatever. This group that it was going on is like new music. And all of a sudden, this dude um, with, a, with a mask shows up on stage and... Uh, the the rap group that is performing they look they're looking at this guy like who who is this like and this guy has like he has a hoodie and a and a stocking mask right just kind of like grilling at the group and you know and then all of a sudden another guy with a f- mask comes in and you know in the stage and then now the rappers are like what's going on right and all of a sudden like eight dudes bum rush the stage with stocking masks and hoodies and just take the dudes out the stage (laughs) pandemonium happens they take the dj out they kick the sound man and all of a sudden (laughs) 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 and the place went bananas right i've been telling this story for the last 20 years (laughs) i get goosebumps whenever i hear that story and (laughs) And and I got an interview with Remescla.com and they found the video and oh. I'm on stage. Oh, that's great. Like I oh, never that's, seen that. I never great. seen that. Like they found the tape of of it's called Jack the Rapper, Wu Tang performance, and I'm on stage like looking like 20 years old. Like it's just I'm like, oh my God, that's me right there. That's what I'm insane, right? <laughs> There's proof. So, yeah, <laughs> man. So <laughs> Fast forward into the photo sh- photo shoot. Um, I never heard anything like it. Now I'm listening to the whole album, the entire production. I was uh, I was in the dungeon, man. Like Raekwon and Method Man rapped in my ears. I was like, oh my god, they spit into my face. Like <laughs> this is yeah. crazy. I never so, heard this. So you were closely intertwined there to to, to really yeah. capture what they were going for. Yeah, but you know, and mind you, I never like I never worked with a camera. Like I was not. I don't, I never been a journalist, you know. I was always an artist creating. I was more of a cinematographer, photographer, yeah. you know. So I was well, well. That those covers are not, you know, documentary. Th- that, yes. th- those are composed. Yes, they're very yeah, composed. Yeah. So I was listening. I was inside their their studio, listening to these beats and uh, these bells and these ancient sounds and these kung fu flicks and 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 he was like, I, I want this to look like. Uh, enter, um, what's that? Enter, enter the, the dragon. dragon. Enter the dragon, right, right. right. Enter the dragon, like Bruce, Bruce Lee. Lee. So I was yeah. like, wow, man, so I can get candles and I can get, you know, all this stuff and, and I can carve the Wu-Tang logo. Like, he only had a cassette with the Wu-Tang logo. So the I was logo. like, let's make that big and let's make like a shrine. And it was a collaborative idea. And, you know, because I, I came from like a very visual stimulating sort of background, I, I, I wanted to do that for hip hop. Um, the day of the shoot, however, that shoot almost got canceled because um, we're here and there was only like five members in the Wu-Tang. And, um, and he was like, oh man, you know, all the boys are not here. So we're not, we're not going to do this. I was like, wait, why don't we do what we, what you did in Atlanta? So he was like, what do you mean? I was like, put a stocking mask on and just come like you bum rush that stage. If I was not in Atlanta at that point in my life, 
that cover wouldn't have happened. So, yes, I was part of the culture and I also was, you know, doing something different and and uh, I got the chance. I mean, and he was like, all right, you mean like not short faces? I was like, yeah, you're the Wu-Tang Clan. It's, it's the Clan. It's not. And he went with it. And the Risa went with it. I was like, all right, let's do it. And and we did history. Wow. <laughs> right there. That's a great that, story. The album, the album sort of, it's one of, I think, Rolling Stone's 25th. Uh, most influential albums. Oh yeah, I mean, of all yeah. times, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, and I think, weird. isn't it, isn't it like a woo secret as to who is actually in the like oh, yeah, what? Yeah, yeah. what? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So obviously, yeah. if, Risa, if indeed it is any of them at right. all. No, no, yeah, there, there, there's uh, five of them. <laughs> yeah, because um, yeah, you don't. Yeah, it's well, obviously Rizzo was there. Rizzo was there. All Dirty was there. Inspector Deck, uh, Ghost, Raekwon, and did I say All Dirty? You did, yeah. Uh, yeah. And uh, the Jiza. It was okay. six of them. Yeah. Okay. It was so you, six bro, of them. No, you got. That's a crazy no, story. No, you got. Yeah. No, crazy Method Man. Uh, no, Thanks for that story, no Master bro. Killer. That story. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's, that's crazy. That's crazy. That's, yeah. that's, that's, that's wild. Yeah. So it was, really I, it was always like, I, I'm always bro. like a problem solver. Like, I never let an opportunity go. Like, I don't yeah. know. We got to do this. And brain start going in. And, and all of a sudden, um, he was like, yeah, let's do it. Wow, great story. We're going to pick up with more from Danny, Eric, Jeanette, and Vicky after a break. Stay tuned. We hope you're enjoying this edition of the B&H Photography Podcast. Send us a tweet at BH Photo Video, hashtag BH Photo Podcast. Maybe we can open up to that idea of, of this collaboration and, and, and yeah. how you look to interpret the music through a visual is there anything that you can can talk about that when you when you're working with artists and and you say listen you look great now you you know the fashion's there but i want to want this image to reflect your music how do you how do you bring that about i i feel like for i feel like the the artists that i feel like i made the most connection with are very um collaborative like lauren hill for example she was already had the album titled miseducation so she came with the idea of a shooting like you know in a school and we 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 scouted like these different schools and then something was like oh we should um maybe just go to your school and she's from new jersey as well which uh, which i'm from and i didn't even know until um i was telling my mom oh i'm up i'm considered for this lauren hill project and she was like, oh, I know Lauren Hill. I, I did her hair. She's, <laughs> she still comes, you know, she was like, she still comes to the to wow. the beauty salon and visits, like after she became famous. And somehow, I guess I was older, so I wasn't hanging out at the mom beauty salon anymore. <laughs> so um, after going to all these different schools, we but we had like a lot of meetings and went to her house and things like that. And um, yeah, she was very like, you know, she had her thing. She had her thing. And I was still younger artists that... Um, the artists that I feel make the biggest connections with just the world and everything are a lot tighter with what they bring to the table. They clearly expect us to make a cool visual, but I find like the ones that the images are usually pretty iconic or they have really good ideas, mm-hmm. you know? Mm-hmm. Oh, mm-hmm. Can we talk about that, uh, the, the Lauren Hill cover specifically? Sure. That's such a iconic sure. cover. Um wow. How was that done? Is it a drawing it's, on the? It's a photograph, but it's it's uh, you know just like retouching. They start with the photograph and start um, retouching it into an etching. And um, they showed me the cover, the idea for the cover, as if I had a say. You know, what I'm saying, <laughs> what do you think? Are you cool with your photo being like this? And I was like, of course, as long as something works, it's not right. really, um, you know. So the fi- okay, so the, the, the what was etched was your photo, exactly, and they etched that onto the desk, exactly, oh, exactly. Cool. So cool. we shot like so many different scenarios, and we didn't really know until, um, you know, that wasn't like the plan, say, going into the shooting. But then um, Urban is really great, and he was very really close to Lauren, and they showed me this thing, and the, you know, like I said, they were just kind of asking if I would be okay with that, and I just thought it looked really incredible. So. Um, now, is that set, is that photo and the contact sheets that that are uh, accompany it part of? Yeah, but the, you know they were or? like you know they were like uh, they were like they this photo. No one's gonna see this photo ever. Uh, type oh. thing, you know. And I was like, okay, you know. And you know, Lauren, I really respect her, and she's like, you know. So I don't like you know, 
I play it cool. I yeah. play it cool with right. us. He's yeah. one of those people, you know? Yep. Well, and, and that's been part of the challenge, I think, of doing this project is, you know, contact sheets are very, they're working docs mm. and they're private and they're kind of, you know, they're the behind the scenes. So certain contact sheets are just more challenging. And also, you know, a lot of artists don't, you know, Lauren. Sure. Um, also, we were close to getting the Lil Kim um, hardcore cover, and the photographer just decided that they were too hardcore. Too too <laughs> hardcore. <laughs> yeah, and also, you know, and then we would have also, you know, and Kim, we didn't know like how Kim would feel about you know showing all of the outtakes from from that shoot. But um, yeah, it's a bummer because you know that's one of those. Like everyone remembers where they were when they saw that poster mm-hmm. yeah. and, and mm-hmm. <laughs> plastered around also, New York. Also, the difference too is between I'm um, like um, Danny was saying in regards to shooting for record labels versus shooting for somehow I should end up thinking I think I shot more editorials and things for magazines, so that's why I feel like I had a little bit more room than mm-hmm. the average. And but also, you know, but also I think that that's maybe had something to do with my photos leaking out into the world as well. But there's pros and cons to you you know to the magazines it's like no one really the artist never looked back and has any issues with anything that we you would share but out of fairness it makes sense when it's like i hired you to shoot this album cover and if this is the only image i want the world to see you kind of want to like not you know respect that yeah, yeah totally yeah. right yeah. right is there is there a hip-hop aesthetic I think there's lots of aesthetics. Right now, Dapper Dan, you know, you guys yeah. know who Dapper Dan sure. is. And so he was, <laughs> yeah, right. So he's like the architect of maybe hip hop style. And, you know, he basically made his own Gucci clothing at the time. And now he's collaborating with Gucci. And right now I'm looking for through my pictures. I just put something up on Instagram of a picture of Sparky D, this woman rapper yes. wearing a wearing one of it and, and she's hugging Millie Jackson who's you know could be like the godmother of you know bad girl rap and it's it's like you know they weren't fashion models they were just wearing the clothes and you know it's sort of come a full circle in a way like what he did what Dap did back in the day now Gucci is actually honoring him and collaborating and they're going to do a store I think and they, you know, they want pictures to hang on the wall. It's like a whole. So the style is really important and very iconic. And you know, it came from the street. Am I right? I and mean, it evolved yeah. too. It evolved too. I think that in the nineties, when money became more involved, because um, when I looked at the photos of Jeanette, it's like I see the genuine personality in the style. But then by the nineties, when I was coming along, it was like, oh, all of the all of the artists wanted to be like in a Calvin Klein campaign or right. something. So they started being more styled in a way that used fashion that, you know, it was across the board. Well, it was that thing when suddenly, you know, you'd do an album cover and they needed a stylist. I mean, before when I started doing, you know, when I was here in the early 80s, nobody had money for stylists. Mm -hmm. You know, you made your own clothes or your mom made clothes or you got them from Dapper Dan or, you know, and then suddenly you're right, there was more money in the 90s and every shoot suddenly, like I did a shoot for Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Five in 1988 just speaking to that thing of people not turning up. And um, they had decided, the group had decided with the record company that they wanted the shoot to take place in a Rolls-Royce showroom. So I had to find a Rolls-Royce showroom and they wanted two models in Lurex bikinis. So I hired my friend Ellen who styled the models. And it was just like this crazy scene in this Rolls-Royce showroom. People would just you know, everybody was kind of, oh, and they had a, written into the contract, they needed a crate of Moe Chandon. <laughs> so everybody is completely drunk. Everybody is out of order. Uh, cowboy hadn't turned up. He was AWOL somewhere. Nobody knew where. So we had to put one of the roadies in his jacket. And then these two <laughs> girls standing in these bikinis and the guys are like running around, you know, and Melly Mel's got his whip. And it was like a crazy scene, but... It wasn't something that I personally had created as an idea like you, mm. you know. It wasn't like I thought, oh, shit, those Pink Floyd covers. I know <laughs> what you're talking about, by the way. Those are amazing. I think but- a big moment um, when it started to change was when 
Puffy and Bad Boy started to come up. That's when you kind of started to see, you know, the mastermind that was Puff with imagery, um, thinking about, like, what his artists were going to sound like, but also simultaneously what they were going to look like. And you had um, stylists, you know, like, that often, you know, like Sybil Penix, who did, um, mm-hmm. I think she did the Jodeci cover. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, she, did. she did, you know, a lot of styling for Mary J. Blige. I mean, she started as Puffy's assistant, and so she kind of knew his aesthetic and then, like, started... You know, coming up like like Mary like Mary's whole look. You know, Tim's hat to the back, baggy clothes, like Pele Pele, all that. Like, I feel like that moment really um, is when like the the stylist and the thinking about like what's the album cover gonna yeah. look like. Yeah. Like, what are the brands? You know, you had like Groovy Lou. You had um, Groovy. <laughs> yeah, like, and I and I, I feel like that those th- that moment in time really signal the change. And I think like, you know, Eric, when I talked to you about your Biggie and Faith vibe cover, um, you kind of talk exactly about that. Like maybe if you want to tell that story. So basically vibe was like, oh, they wanted to do a classic cover. They showed me these Rolling Stone type covers. And I was always like that kind of geek too. So it's like, I'd always known those books that back when I was a kid going Mm -hmm. to the record stores of the greatest album covers of all times, greatest magazine covers, things like that. So they wanted to do something like that. And they were very open. And it's like, I felt like they hadn't really done any covers outside, maybe one by then. So I came with them. I found the car. We rented it. I think it was from a Bronxdale. And then um, we. I kind of thought it would be great to shoot any of the Brooklyn Bridges because that's, you know. Is it Brooklyn Bridge Park? Is that where that is? Well, you know, but it's two locations with people that know. It's like one location is, what do you call that that little strip where you look down to the water? It's like seven. The seven promenade. From, like, it's like all of those little streets that... In Dumbo, you're talking Dumbo. about. Dumbo, yeah, yeah. that's yeah. there. But then the, okay. the nighttime shot is underneath the Brooklyn mm-hmm. Bridge. And that's when, yeah, I was telling you one, but Biggie was like, oh, so first first up, so when Puffy and Big came to the shoot, they didn't, he wasn't really comfortable with any clothes that they had for um, Biggie. So they left for hours and we just kind of all hung out. Interesting. So he was real back. hands-on with the, with picking out every detail. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah totally. Right, so right, he, yeah. they came back hours later and I was always the type that was like, I like the time when waiting. I love when artists were late because you'd, I'd have so much anxiety anyways. So by the time, like, <laughs> everything, you know, so I was just very comfortable with the fact that they were gone for hours and they came back, had us look all together. And um, so we did a couple of shoots and shots in the first location, but they gave us enough time that I would thought that, okay, since we lost half to the day, we'll just have that one location. But they were like, no, we can go to the second shoot. So we went to the second shoot, um, Underneath the Brooklyn Bridge, at that point, it's like dark. It's completely nighttime, mm-hmm. and Big was like, "Yo, man, that's where they like. That's where they. That's where they dumped the bodies. That's where they dumped." And we were all like wrestling, trying to get everything done, <laughs> you know, and not barely interested. Now it's like Big is so important to all of us. It's like you kind of would have sat on every word and gave him all the attention, but we were just like, "Yeah, yeah, yeah." Like, well, oh. it's interesting, kind of what we're getting at too, which is, I guess, the the, the idea behind the book is that we're talking twenty, thirty years now, and it, it is history. You know, at the time, I think. People, you know, you're just getting this stuff done and, and the aesthetics, they change fast. And now there's a time to kind of reflect. I mean, you, you were talking about and you talked about looking back at contact sheets and seeing images that now may mean something that at the time necessarily didn't or, or weren't as interesting as the shot you selected. So, uh, And also uh, looks in hip hop change all the time. right? I mean, it, right. it's about progression. It's about yeah. you know what's fresh right now. You know, and it's, it's, I mean, there's obviously there's hints of the past, but, Mm -hmm. but I think that that's part of the art form, right? Yeah. Like back then they wouldn't wear skirts and. Exactly. (laughs) Now they are. Right. But you know, and, and, and I mean, like one of the things I also explain is like rock and roll went through that too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. You know, like after the eighties dudes were putting like lipstick on and long hair, you know what I mean? Like it, it, it's like, of course, hip hop is also going through that progression or evolution, you know, like today. The look is not the same as it was in the nineties. You right. know, well, we have like a perfect example. I mean, we have yeah. you know, kind of the almost yeah. the whole spectrum here of of, of looks from. The I 80s never forward. shot. Yeah. I never shot without a stylist. Oh, yeah. All my shoots, like wow. I think after the Wu Tang, everything was stylist coming through. Like mm-hmm. everything mm-hmm. was part of. Any of you guys shots were just calling up the artist and saying, "Hey." I want to get a shot of you. Or were they always kind of through a record label or, or a, a magazine or... Me personally, it was all through a record label. Mm-hmm. I actually never worked for an artist. Mm-hmm. I always mm-hmm. worked through the 
with a label. The label will contact me first, and through the label, I will meet the artist. Like they will arrange. I was kind of like a big deal back then. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, they will arrange the meeting, and I will meet the artist in their office and stuff like that. So I never met the artist before. That okay. probably gives you a certain, a, a, a better deal of credibility when dealing with the artist, because if it's just you and the artist, you're kind of equals, and they can kind of control. I heard horror take, stories. Yeah, whereas if a record company um, says, this is who is going to be photographing yeah. you for our product, right. that has to give a different context and, to it. And when, when, the, when the artist will see my work... Then we're like, oh yeah, I want that guy. You know, that's the guy that I wanted, or whatever. And and it was, uh, I went straight for the for the for the music industry. But the time has changed too, right? Oh yeah. It's, but it's, now, it's, now I feel like I um, am more connected to artists than labels mm-hmm. by far. Mm-hmm. You know, so absolutely. I, that's a change you know, in the music industry, though. Yes, yeah. totally. By the time it was like, okay, a publicist is like, I don't think my artist should be seen like that. I was like, oh, that's not exactly the imagery that I feel like I grew up when you would have a point of view. So I feel like it kind of made sense that in some ways that kind of made things crash and burn in a sense too. Now it's like kind of full circle where artists are in control of their own vision and everything and basically with social media see you on instagram and say hit you up and say yo i wanted you to do photos and and vice versa you know and things don't have to be okay uh, they just they just put them up right yeah totally yeah. Yeah. like my latest some of my latest work has been with with he's right like with artists yeah. because uh, number one artists i think when they respect you now they they respect my work in terms of like, wow, you're legendary. I like to work with you. And uh, I work with uh, Taylor Momsen from The Pretty Reckless. And she wanted to basically, you know, have a, a full buyout. She wanted to do that. And we negotiated, <clears throat> right, in terms of like me negotiating with her and then me getting some residuals back for merchandising, like directly with the artist. And, she has like a million followers, you know what I mean? So so for me, is it's an amazing time that I couldn't do that back in the 90s, right? And today record companies are not really interested in that because they want a full 360. Right. So he's right, things are changing in terms of like, now I can deal with an artist and, and be like, this is what I want. And they respect it, you know. And having access to their social media, it's almost like the artist is more valuable than the uh, than the label. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Some true. of these artists have a million followers, and yeah. think about it: you you strike a deal with them, you sell T-shirts, you get a residuals. That's going to be some good money. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay, we are going to take a short break, and we're going to come back with more hip hop, past, present, and future. If you'd like to reach out to us with your questions or comments, email us at podcast at bhphoto.com. Okay, we are back. Now we're going to start talking about the specifics about pictures and experiences and things of that sort. I I had a couple questions for Jeanette. Yeah. So there's obviously, I'm sure you get a lot of questions about this photo, but I'm going to ask anyway. Uh, this, the the iconic Slick Rick with the champagne and the Fendi bag and the crotch grab. Right. What Can you talk about that? Um, well, that was, uh, I was hired by Def Jam to do a PR shoot for, the, you know, for them, for Slick Rick. And, uh, you know, he's British and his whole style is kind of like something I was very used to seeing because I... I was living in Stratton when I was in London and it's right by Brixton and it's that kind of, you know, Jamaican style of a sort of a smart kind of almost mod looking suit and a tie and, you know, the beret. He looked really good. So we decided to have him come and, you know, I'm very much, you know, I don't like posing people. So I would have my studio set up and I'd have my little mark on the floor and we gave him a bottle of champagne and we're hanging around chatting and listening to music and throwing it down and Bill Adler, the PR's there and we're ch- chatting away and, you know, he's drinking, we're all having a good time. And then I'm like, okay, so let's take the picture. Here's your spot. And I've got my camera set up. I don't really use a tripod. I'm like more free flow. So I go, just stand over here. And he just put his bag down on the floor and he was still holding the bottle of champagne and click, I took the picture. And it's like... 
it's just a moment. It's a moment in time, and I feel like it's so him. He's grabbing his crutch, and he's got this a little smile on his face. It's just so hip hop to me. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. And you know, I kind of love that. You know, it was really about our relationship at that moment. Really, was that that grab and that look at you, or was that did he, did he take several <laughs> shots with that pose? You know, there was just well, you wait till you see the contact sheet. There's yeah. a few shots, but. That one is the one. There's yeah. no doubt about it. Yeah. It just has everything in it that said, you know, everything about that moment and, you know, how we were in the studio. We were just relaxed. Yeah. And he was just yeah. like, yo, th- that's yeah. it. Do you <laughs> think being from England, you know, and having that that connection kind of informed the session at all? Was it? You know, maybe, yeah. I mean, we were just chatting, you yeah. know, yeah. and everybody knew, you know, I was like crazy British Photographer. Yeah. <laughs> that had yeah. this little <laughs> studio down on Lafayette Street. So. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, maybe it did. but I mean, I, He probably didn't run into that every day. I mean, no, yeah. and, you know, that was always my thing. Yeah. That people really – when I first came here, I mean, people hadn't met people from England. Mm-hmm. You know, you would go out to, you know, far-flung Brooklyn. They hadn't met people from Britain before because people didn't travel. People didn't have money. And, right. you know, I could have been from Mars as far as, you know, a lot of people were concerned. Yeah. So – you know, that was always a good good starting point conversation. What, did, what was your look back then? Did, were you like looking like a punk or kind of new new wave or were you, you into the hip hop look? Or You know what? I was probably still wearing it, probably exactly what I'm wearing Doc right Martin, today. Like I don't, you know, I was probably wearing, you know, like some kind of sneakers in the summer or docks in the winter, white Levi's. And a nun's habit. <laughs> yeah, and a nun's habit, yeah, and a T-shirt. I mean, that was my look is pretty much exactly what, what I'm wearing today. Um, and, uh, you know, in the winter, oh, well, after 1988 when I got my Def Jam jacket from Def Jam mm-hmm. cool. with my name on it, embroidered in it, I would be wearing that all the time, of course. Oh, yeah, definitely. And yeah. what were you shooting? Were you shooting Hasselblad? Did you I say? was shooting pretty much everything on the Hasselblad. Mm. And so I, you know, and I'm very minimal with equipment. I never wanted to have a lot of equipment. Partly I'm small. I don't like carrying a lot of heavy stuff. And right. I never had the money to buy a load of cameras. And I just thought... You know, no insult to the guys, but it was like a boy thing to have, you know. I got eight lenses and I've got, you know, uh, here's my long lens and here's my other camera and I got the, you know. Yeah, I've got the X. So you do do understand then. Yeah, I get it. You understand. I I totally get why you guys need that. Yeah. I do. But we we women, we don't need to rock that. But you know, it's all that. So I don't mean to disrespect you guys. No, I'm kidding. (laughs) We have to compensate. They can handle it. It's compensation. It's not your fault. (laughs) But I just, you know, that's exactly it. But I just had like one Hasselblad body and some backs and a Polaroid back. Even for the Um, street stuff? Even on the street? Yeah, and I would go on the train. I mean, when I did that picture of Run DMC out in Hollis, Queens. That was my my next uh, question there. Oh, shall I? No, no, get get going. I commissioned for the Face magazine, which was like Uh, a really iconic, I have to say, style, British style mm -hmm. magazine, style music. You guys, I'm sure, all saw it. It was was great, and I'd worked on it from the very first issue. And they knew I'd moved here, so they were always calling me, and they're like, oh, there's this new group, Run DMC. I didn't know who they were, 1984. Here is a phone number. Just call this number. So it turned out to be Jam Master Jay's mom's house, I think. <laughs> they were like, hi, you know, I'm Jeanette, I'm from The Face. Uh, you know, and they're probably, what's that? It's a British magazine, we want to come to. And they're like, okay, you know, come, you know, next Tuesday, meet me at the Hollis Queen Station. And I didn't know where Hollis was. Not being from here, I didn't know what type of neighborhood it was going to be. You know, I was used to going up to the Bronx and Harlem and whatever. So I just jump on the train with my Hasselblad and I've got the backs all loaded because I was, you know, ready for action. Mm-hmm. And got out at Hollis and there's Jay and he's like, hey, you know, walks me down the street. And it's like this beautiful tree-lined street. Looks, you know, like some really nice kind of suburb, nice houses. There's a bunch of guys hanging out by a car. And I'm like, oh, hi, you know. You look great. Just get a little closer. I took the picture, and that picture is maybe one of my best pictures, I hate to say, that I've ever taken. Hopefully I'm trying to aspire to do something better, so (laughs) always aspiring. But I really love that picture because it's such a moment in time. Like some people are looking at cameras, some aren't. The styles, you know, it's got Adidas, it's got Gazelles, it's got, Mm -hmm. you know, what everybody's wearing is very iconic and classic Kangol's. 
and it's like dappled sunlight. And it was sort of a turning point in a way because, you know, before you thought of hip-hop as coming from the boogie down Bronx, you know, burnt out buildings, and then suddenly you're on this sort of tree-lined mm -hmm, street mm -hmm. and there's cars and people are dressed nicely and they've got like a little mixer. And well, you feel family, you know, you feel yeah. family, neighborhood, you feel those kind of bonds. Yeah. Totally, yeah. and it just, it really did change everything. And it was so crazy back in the day because you just had this phone number of someone's house. You didn't know who you were calling. There was no cell phones. Mm -hmm. There's no, you know, internet. There's no way of getting in touch with people, you know. So if that person isn't there, you know, that's it. That's the end of that. So it was It was always an adventure. Yeah, you really get the sense that, you know, they're in their hometown in that, right. that picture. Like, and, you know, doing what they usually do. Right, exactly. You know, and, yeah. It's got a very natural feeling to it. It's just that, you know, I, mean, I always feel like I'm sort of somewhere between a documentary and a portrait photographer. Mm -hmm. So right. mm -hmm. you just want to mm -hmm. capture that moment. Can I jump, actually throw that question out to you guys about posing people? Uh, how, do you, how do you feel about it? How do you do it? Uh, any tricks? What, what's, what do you think? I mean, it depends. Some people are pose really good mm. and, and some poses just... Don't you know? Yeah. Like, so you, you, even you amongst gotta, performers, you find some of them are hard to have in front of a yeah, camera. Yeah, really? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, I feel like you gotta kind of understand the artists that you're shooting. Some some people are timid. Do, some, do you guys listen to all the like, all the work of the people that you shoot? I mean, do you, did you, you try make I, a point of it? I well, I mean, because I did album covers, yeah. I had to definitely listen to. But let let's say uh, a person like Nas, for example. Uh, Nas, it takes him, from what I remember, because I only shot him like two times, it takes him a minute to like get acclimated with, with, with the set, you know? So, uh, you know, I, I'm not going to have somebody like that posing right away. You know what I mean? I let him sit down, right, I let him, chill him you know, down. let him chill, and then we talk, and, and, you know, you get the conversation. Maybe I get him more into like a pensive state like thinking about something and reminiscing and things like that and all of a sudden you start the chemistry because as a photographer you're kind of like a like a movie director too like you kind of you have to get the subject you have to capture that moment you have to direct them get them comfortable mm -hmm. some 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 artists they already come ready to go ready to post yeah, you know yeah. ready to and then they they might have that flashy attitude and that they want to portray and I capture that too. Um, so I, I, I kind of any work stories with about audience. having to kind of tell somebody to kind of you know, enough of the flash, enough of the pose. I want the real you, and, and how do you kind of um, remove those layers? Yeah, well, well, when I when I shoot, I will I will do like maybe um, like four or five sets in one day, you know. So I, I will have plenty of time. What I use, I will used to have like a little sort of. Um, like, I will get all the publicity stuff out first, right? Like, you know, white background, publicity stuff, you know, and just get... And then the publicity stuff, a record company will hire you to do, you know, an entire package. This is a product. You were shooting a CD cover, a product, right? So you had to kind of, like, cover... What's a CD? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right? <laughs> uh, you, have to, you have to cover all bases. You have to ca cover your marketing... Uh, you know, pictures, your album cover, your publicity shots, like everything. Yeah. So I would like to sort of always get that publicity stuff out because that's when they were like flashy and this and that, right? And by the time that they pro progress, I would really end up with like the creative stuff, yeah. right? Where, where now I took care of like, quote unquote, the boring requirements of the yeah. record label, yeah. right? And then all of a sudden now I could get to play. So I will get lighting and this and that and more conceptual towards the and end. hopefully by that time you you know the, the person better. Yeah, and by that time, I mean, it was like, you know, 10, 12, sometimes 14, 16 hour day. Yeah, yeah. So. You were talking about Nas. Can you talk about the, the, the I Am album cover? Is that just <laughs> any stories there? Or? <laughs> yeah. I was always doing crazy stuff, man. Um, the The concept came from his first album and second album being a boy in front of the projects and then the second being a man and then the third album the art director was like we really want to do like him as a king like you know and the idea was like king tut right the sarcophagus 
<laughs> and um, and I was like, oh man, you know, I got this great sculptor, and his name is Dave Cortez. Today, Dave Cortez is one of like the top toy sculptors of the world. Like he does everything from the Hulk to Spider Man to everything. Just Google him; it's incredible. So um, I hired him then to to sculpt that sarcophagus uh, face. And, um, you know, the process was to put clay in his face and, uh, and, uh, we, we did Nas was really, you know, with it and it was something different and we, we put clay on his face, but, um, like after like five minutes, all of a sudden he started like kicking and, you know, jerking and stuff. <laughs> it was like the clay was gone on his nose because apparently like we didn't, or they didn't set the up the, not, the, yeah. the, not the cotton, like with the straws. Oh, and he was going reading. through the straws. And he was like, oh, wow. we were almost killing Nas. You <laughs> almost <laughs> killed <laughs> Yeah, yeah man. No. And we're like, oh, man, we had to like, we had to get the clay because it was also getting hard because he's oh. like a quick drying clay. <laughs> and then, man, we had to get that shit out of his face. And then oh. he was like, oh. <laughs> oh really? <laughs> we didn't kill Nas. He's okay. <laughs> Thank God. That's hilarious. He was a great sport. We did it again. And um, and and man, yeah, man, that that could have gone the other way. Wow, <laughs> could have gone wrong I, I have so a, I, I fast. Have a, I have a question that's yeah. it's not specific to hip hop. It has to do with the fact we've been talking about. You guys started off shooting for LPs. Yeah, where you have a twelve by twelve inch canvas, and yeah. then it goes down to CDs, which is a quarter that size. And now we're dealing with little thumbnails that you know. Mm -hmm. Okay, do you find that your approach to photographing these musicians has changed now that you have a smaller vehicle to portray? That was the, as the picture size comes down, you can't get as elaborate and detailed. You have to deal with stronger, bolder shapes and uh, a simpler content, visual content. You can't squeeze too much information into a small area. Do you, is that, mm. that affected you at all? Well, I mean, but you're only seeing like, I, it's just like one thing. Like, I, I think right now a record, it's not, it's not a product anymore as in like a campaign, mm -hmm. like a website, the opening page, you know, like it, it, there's a lot of things that go into place. Okay. So you can, you can still shoot the same way. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, I, I don't think like, you know, a record right now is like, it's that, it's just, I think it's a whole campaign, a whole... So you still get part. to play and push yeah, the envelope. Yeah, you still yeah. do, yeah, right, absolutely. Good. For sure, and you know, someone's going to put it up on the screen, it's going to be the size of your computer screen, which could be yeah. bigger than 12 by yeah. 12. Yeah. Well, and it's, I just miss seeing them in the window of Tower Records. I really do. Because that used to be so oh, hot, man, you'd walk tell out and like, about oh, it. that's <laughs> my EPMD oh, cover, man, wow. Oh man, that was... <laughs> it was well, and, and also being able, you know, to turn them around and see what's on the back. Yeah. A lot of times the photo yeah. that was on the back, like, Danny, your, your hard-to-earn cover was Guru and Premiere on the front, but on the back it was like, oh, the whole yeah. Gangstar Foundation and seeing, you know. Absolutely. I, yeah, you know, I used to love, you know, the, ins totally. the inside the sleeves, inside the back. Oh, like, yeah. Yeah, one, one time going into in what she's saying about Tower Records and Virgin Megastore, I had three records at the same time, you know, in the 42nd Street, they, where they have four spots, three of the records were mine on 42nd Street. <laughs> Amazing. And I was like, oh! I and I took it. a picture, like, you, you understand, like, how amazing that, that felt going into yeah. a record But was store? it deflating with the end of the day you had to still swipe your Metro card to get it? <laughs> <laughs> After no, all that. It was totally. Uh, was 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 something <laughs> when talking about that? Oh, well, you know what? I feel like the one thing I've learned kind of from the internet and everything is that basically I have no idea what's going to happen in the future. So it's like it doesn't really affect the way that you do anything because if someone has said, oh, you're – photos that were in a magazine cover for 30 days is going to be here forever. It's kind of like the same approach to life now. I don't know that if it seems like it's a thumbnail now that it won't be at some point in the future, this photo that in some medium is like completely it's huge again. Yeah, yeah, right. You know what I'm saying? That's and, really true. And then in addition to that, you're asking about the posing thing, but to me, I feel like my soul a little bit is more, more than having people pose. It's like you kind of create an environment that let people that inspire people to 
produce what you're interested in. So whether it be the music, whether it's the location, you know what I'm saying? It's like you, it's, it, it's still collaborative in that way. I wouldn't say to pose this way specifically, but you set it, you set a tone that kind of inspires people right. to be where you are. And it's very much about, yeah, the collaboration, your relationship with a person. It's like Danny was saying, you know, mm -hmm. you talk to them, you get them relaxed mm -hmm. and, you know, you're chilling and then suddenly like, okay, you're yes. on and that. They feel good. Yeah. Do you guys usually play music? And they can music? do their thing. You usually oh, play yeah. Music. Always. Part of it. And, and oh, the yeah. music of the artist you're shooting, or is that sometimes All not the way of it. Yeah. 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 It doesn't yeah. matter. It depends. Yeah. Whatever. Whatever they're into. Whatever they're yeah. into. Yeah, they might yeah. want to listen to music Aretha is, Franklin. Sure. It's fine by music me. Music is definitely part of oh, it. Oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's depending on the mood. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, yeah For yeah. sure, you always had a lot of And And Danny, what were you shooting? What was your setup, your cameras back then? Do you remember? I had everything. There you go. What I tell you? What I tell you? Dude, I even had a 4 by five field camera that oh, yeah. I took nice. and to shoot and and will cover myself and oh, yeah. the bells like I was I, I was I, I was in love with the entire gear junkie yeah, yeah everything yeah. man like I had I own a Hasselblad I own an RC67 mm -hmm. uh, like I graduated to the RC67 and and recently like I tried to shoot with that I was like that shit was so heavy, man. Like, how could I <laughs> do this all day? Thing. Lift and with I your was, knees. Lift with your knees. All remember, all yeah. day, all day. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, all these big covers that I did. I I, I started with the Hasselblad, and then I loved the um, the the frame rate of the that's RC six seven, yeah. right? That yeah. gave you more of a rectangular, but yeah. it wasn't so so rectangular that like like the thirty five millimeter, it was yeah. close to square. Like I love that. I love their lenses, and I started really using the R six seven. But um, the thirty six chambers. What was that? Hasselblad R six six seven. Oh, it was. Yeah, okay. that was the R six six seven. Yeah, yeah. Mamiya. Yeah. Can you break down technically how you shot that? Because you have like the kind of the long exposure that they're on the sides. You can yeah. see like. Uh, the candles kind of blurring, but then mm -hmm. it's sharp in the middle. Yeah. Well, uh, I I think like I I learned pretty early like what a stroke does and how to react and 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 what happens to an image when that burst of light comes in and just hits it right. And um, I was doing a lot of like a lot of experimentation with strobe and available light and sunsets. And I will, I will be like the first one to bring like a Norman 400 B, which was like a first portable, you know, strobe that you'll carry on your shoulder. And then laughably you know, portable by today's standards. Right. <laughs> laughably because three of them. you will only get like <laughs> maybe 40 pops. If, if yeah. any, like, you know, you will. And even before that, I actually will take like a mashed potato, right. And put a cable to the thing and move it outside the camera to use it as a strobe. Because I understood that once you remove that strobe, then all of a sudden you have studio lighting, you know, because once you, you get off the camera, yeah. once you get off the camera, man, you have creative lighting, right? Yeah. So, um, when I got to shoot the Wu-Tang, I already had a clear understanding that when the strobe goes off and you have that shutter speed open, all the available light will also... It'll be recorded onto yeah, the film. Yeah, it will be recorded. It will, it will change the image, right? So I will, I, will, I will shoot in the dark. I will shoot in the dark and then whatever, whatever available light will have, will, I will let that sort of play with the image, right? So in that particular shoot, the candles were, were also were available light, right? The strobe will go and then everything will be in the dark and then I'll sort of, will move the camera a little bit to give it so the candles look moved, right? And then there, there was also, I had tungsten light in the back pointing towards the logo. So there you have like, that also will look blurry a little bit, but the guys will look sharp because that burst of light will come through. You know, you, you, you'll get that. And since you're shooting in the dark, it will not get affected. So that it was a combination of shutter speed, aperture, and, and like how steady I can hold the camera. I will always kind of shoot, I will say very like, very open, like, you know, 5.6, you know, F-stop. And then the, because then, then I wouldn't have to, uh, on the shutter speed, I could go like maybe 
a half a second or not so long of exposure, not so long that because once you once you pass a, a second, then yeah, everything is too shaky, right? So I would kind of play with that, a combination of that, and uh, and then magic will happen. <laughs> what are you shooting now? What, I, I'm I'm a um, 5D fan. 5D. Uh, yeah, I was always a Canon guy. My first camera was uh, the Canon A1. Mm-hmm. To this day, I have it, yeah. and I love it. That's yeah. Cool. <laughs> um, and then uh, as as I started, you know, switching to digital, I started kind of selling all my all my uh, film stuff and. And uh, I got into 5D. I love the 5D. Wait, do you have the new one, the Mark IV? Yeah, I have the Mark IV, yeah. <laughs> and and once, um, once, and I don't, know, I don't know if they share the same feeling, but once the video, once this 35 millimeter camera started also giving you the possibility to shoot video, I never went back. Uh, it, it, it's almost like technology caught up with me. And I say that, because I always wished when I was shooting the Wu-Tang that I, that I could have recorded that with video, with good video, because the video that was available back then was horrible. It was like security <laughs> cameras today, right? right. So, <laughs> right? So, so I always feel like, wow, man, if I would have had that 5D back then, right, to record what I saw, right? And today... Once video came in those cameras, man, I was like, I started shooting movies, I started shooting videos, and and now I'm more of a cinematographer yeah. than a photographer. Uh, but Eric, uh, I know you, I read that you said uh, you only shoot digital, but if they pay you enough, or was yeah, that the I mean, phrase? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, only because basically I just like, you know, never really figured it out, and it's like I always felt super talented with the camera, and it's like whenever I shoot something digitally, I felt like I was crap as a photographer. So <laughs> just based on the way that it came out, made me not really go down that route. And so even as far as films, um, I've been shooting 16 millimeter movies. So, I mean, it's like even with moving imagery, I still shoot film everything pretty much for the most how part. Much is, how much of an effort is it to kind of to keep shooting film though? Is it? I don't know. That's what every, people ask. But in a way, I think because they're like, oh, is it expensive? But I think because I never really stopped, I can't really tell the difference. Mm. I don't have like a lot of expensive digital equipment either. So I don't know if it balances out or anything, but I... I just kind of like, in addition to bigger budget things, I've also always shot like a lot of things that were that were little to no budget just because they were inspired. So you just kind of find a way to you create a style in a way that kind of supports you being able to do something that's got a smaller budget sometime as well, you know? So, I mean, if that means like sometimes you shoot like so little film, like one roll or whatever or... Yeah. So, you know. You're just always aware of the cost of a roll of film. You know, roll of <laughs> film, develop and process, and then you'd go in the dark room. Everything had a price ticket to it. So if you'd shoot two rolls of 120, you knew how much that cost and, yeah. you know, make the, a really nice... The larger nice the format, the more judicious you are about when you press that button. Exactly. Plus too many people are involved, I think, because basically before digital, you tr- you, sh- you, tr- you trust the photographer. And it's like when in the few scenarios that I was on and someone would be looking at the monitor and say, let's do that again this way. I just felt like something about that wasn't supposed to happen. Right. You know what I'm saying? It's, it's like you. So right. It's like some random person is like, I like that, but only if you turned a little bit more of that. And I was like, what are they? Who are they to have any opinion <laughs> in any of this? Yeah, because it used to be you do one Polaroid and everybody would look right. at it and you go, how's the, because I, I always use the Polaroid for the lighting. The lighting. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Does everybody like the lighting? Yes. And it wasn't anything to do with the posing or the mm-hmm. way the person mm-hmm. looked. And then you'd just do the shoot. And then we'd all look at it, you know, three days later. But now it's like everybody, you do a couple of shots, you put it up on the computer, everybody gathers around, oh, I'm mm. not sure the hair. Yeah. Yeah. And it, you're right, it's too many opinions and there's you lose a little bit of the spontaneity like that, I think. Mm. Yeah. Mm. So, uh, Eric, on the, uh, well, maybe the, the two shots, we, we talked a bit about the, the Lauren Hill album cover. What, do you remember what you shot, what you were using? It? Yeah, I shot a Mamiya 6x7 as Mamiya. well. I mean, it's very easy to me because I was like, as in the sense that I never, I'm not really super technical. So, I mean, you know, I had the six by seven and now I have you shoot the 35. And if something required more than that, I would just rent it. I never really had like a lot of um, equipment or anything like that. So most of the shots is 
maybe a six by seven. And uh, then I wanted to mention the the Hot Boys photos uh, with Little Wayne, which it looked like you were just kind of hanging with them. In a way, that was kind of like a little bit of a turning point because it's like this. I had this friend, you know, I have all kinds of quirky personalities, friends in my life, and this one dude that was in jail, I used to be really cool with. And he says, <laughs> "That's the best intro I've heard in a while." <laughs> <laughs> so he would say, "Like, listen, let's um, so send me photos, but you know, send me photos as if like." Pink was sitting in your living room hanging out. And I was like, oh, wow, that's so interesting. And it kind of inspired something because I was like, oh, shoot, I get it. I think people are really maybe past like things being so produced and so retouched. So I kind of went after having gone through that period with, um, you know, with those photos a bit more set up. And remember I was saying I didn't really like have such a history of being that involved in it as much as I would just show up. So this conversation with my friend who are going back and forth with and, you know, writing letters and things like that inspired me to create photos that were a little bit more as if I was hanging out with people. And I got the the context cameras and started mixing it between things a bit more set up. So now I look back and it's like, you know, cool, it's time's change, but I'm like, oh, those clubs in the late 80s and this and that, like all of those times that I didn't have that kind of style and that kind, kind of camera, I missed something, but I got something else. Yeah, that was the deal. I kind of started being a little bit more of a fly on the wall. Was that down in Louisiana? That you... was down in Louisiana. Yeah, that yeah. that shoot, and I think I shot, also shot the Dipset guys in a similar way than that as well. And yeah, Urkabedu and all those kids. That Dead Prez shot too. That's on your site. Yeah, yeah that was pretty cool. That, I wanted to ask about that. That where where was that? The Dead Prez shot. I that was a that that. Oh, the Dead Prez. Oh, that was either for Days and Confused because I, I think the I worked for the Face too, but I think that that was after they collapsed or something, but. You know, those magazines like that, which were my absolute favorite, and they never had any kind of budget. I just feel like, I was like, okay, let's meet up. And I feel like those guys were very, like, you know, they're deep. And they're like, oh, I want to shoot in, like, say, like a record store and a bookstore. So it was really as simple as that. I think we took some photos in the taxi going from one location to the other, but just with a 35 camera. And like I said, I had to come up with that style like that because I wanted to keep producing and I didn't, um, you know, it's like I didn't want to spend my own money on having a team of people around me to make a photo look a certain way. And in addition to that, I just thought that people kind of like, like the intimacy part. Especially your yeah the, the dip set shot because you you don't really see pictures of them like that you know what I mean it's more more glitzy you know what I mean more I don't know mixtapey kind of and with that you know those kind of documentarian almost shots right. where that's a, it was an interesting way they specifically the one with with jewels and uh, and camera camera yeah, yeah. yeah I mean you know but in the beginning they were like they were always like even now they're like that's one of my favorite shoots that was one of my all time favorite shoots but I found out after the case that the record company just did, wasn't really filling the shoot that much and I think they were saying that because at that point everything looked so big and expensive so it's kind of you know a vindication that at the end of the day those photos of him would be so important, but the record company was being very indifferent. But I was just like, you whatever. see those pictures around yeah, though, everywhere. You see it. You yeah. see that shot everywhere. Totally. Yeah. How important it is to to kind of stand your ground in those cases and say, you know what, you may not like it, but in you I like what? it. They like it in twenty years. It's I always be great. had. I wasn't thinking to in twenty years in the future, but I was always pretty comfortable in my own skin, so I didn't really feel like. Um, suits necessarily had a better idea of like i said my friend in jail is t telling me what people <laughs> are into in the world and i was always that type that was curious about more alternative type of personalities and in conversations so i didn't feel like you know those squares could really tell me what to do what kind was cool of. And what wasn't yeah exactly yeah, yeah. you know can you talk about the Aaliyah uh, vibe? Okay, so yeah. the Aaliyah was basically, everyone thinks it's for vibe because basically... Oh, well, that wasn't for vibe? No, then? it was shot oh. initially for Entertainment Weekly. And that was like in <laughs> 2001. That was before she passed away. And, um, you know, I just felt like there was something about... It's, it's, it's interesting that Aaliyah, and I, I, you know, there's so many of her fans that I've become friends with online. But it's like basically, it's as if like they all think that... Um, 
Leah and I had this really like big history, but I know that there was photographers she'd worked with more than me because I'd only met her that one time. And um, so I shot her for Entertainment Weekly mostly because I was like interested in Leah. So I was like, I'll shoot her for anywhere. So we shot that photos and then she passed so soon afterwards. So, but before then, she also, before she passed, she hit me up and wanted to see the contacts, you know. And she, I sent her the contacts and she marked which ones she liked. And for someone who didn't know her, like compared to those other photographers, I felt like in a weird kind of way, she left me to tell part of her story with, okay, this is what I like. And then she passed away and those photos um, became, you know, her fans, her followers became so attached to that shoot. But that was just our one exchange, you know? And then by because I'd worked with them and I had a good, good relationship with them, they knew about the shoots. So they were like, oh, we're calling in photos of Aaliyah because she just passed away. And so that photo clearly became a bigger photo in, in the context of a magazine cover became bigger than the inside story that Entertainment Weekly had done that they kind of took the shoot from. Interesting. From Entertainment Weekly and, and owned it kind of, you know. So it ended up on that it was that was like the memorial exactly uh, a, a cover mm-hmm. right yeah. yeah are there any photos maybe like this that you never expected to be as big as they were i think most of them <laughs> i mean <laughs> you know because yeah. you're just out there taking pictures yeah. you know you're doing it you're in it you're in the moment and you never really expect that 30 years later some of these things are going to be you know s- labeled so-called right. iconic right. images right. 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 to me it's I mean, it's it's amazing to have that history. Or, or maybe a, a, this is maybe the classic cheesy question, but is there one photo that you m- might look back and say that's the photo that's gonna that I'll you know the hip hop photo anyway that that I'm gonna be remembered for? Or that's a photo that the one photo. Is I mean, in my like case, that? I probably that Run DMC and Posse picture is yeah. just to me. It just is a lot about the way I work. Yeah. You know, it's yeah. documentary, yeah. it's a moment in time. It's turns out, you know, they weren't known at that point. They weren't a big group. You know, a lot of the groups that I shot and I'm still shooting now are not big. You know, were not big at the time. So I, I think maybe that's my mm. shot. Yeah. Danny? I mean, I think uh, undeniably the 36 chambers, it's, it's what people mostly sort of gravitate to. I do have a lot of contenders, you know, on uh, on the portfolio, right? But uh, that's... What's a personal favorite? Um, Wow. Uh, I I would have to say that the J. Rue, the Damager, you can't... uh, The Sun Rises in the East, because if you go back into that, it kind of has like... It was a it, it was based on a war play that he did before that, like blowing spots like the World Trade Center, and this was like 1993, way before 9/11, and and in the picture you see almost almost like 9/11, the image, but you know I mean this is like 10 years before, so it it, it hits home pretty like crazy. I have phone calls like, oh my God, you almost, you predicted 9-11 on this picture. <laughs> like, and it's kind of crazy and scary, you know? Yeah. Like when you see the album cover, you're like, it kind of looks like 9-11 <laughs> 10 years before yeah. it happened. It's funny so that was, There's a lot of hip hop Im- imagery that took place in front of the World Trade the, Center. The yeah. World yeah. Trade. Was it was like, that. it was, was very, well, that. it was very symbolic, yeah. you know, I of. Did, yeah. I personally did like 20 photo shoots in front of World Trade Center. Yeah. Absolutely. Wow. Yeah. I don't know that I'm, you know what, it's like when I'm a favorite, I kind of feel a lot more, I think, detached from my images than other people do that are looking at them. But I would just say that probably the Biggie and Faith photo would be like the photo that people probably would feel connected to. And And the way that I would too is because there's definitely something... There's definitely something moody and darker about it for the context of a magazine cover. And I remember George Pitt saying, you know what, I thought it would be a bit more lit. And I still was like, oh. and I remember when it was out for that 30 days, whenever I saw the magazine cover, I felt really uncomfortable. And it was kind of like that day when the new magazine came along, I felt like more at ease for some reason. But the as far as the surprise a little bit is the Aaliyah shoot, I feel like is more unlike my photos than my other photos in the way that I don't think that it's nearly as gritty or anything yeah, yeah. or have like that kind of edge. And I feel like I followed her lead and she was the boss. 
and I felt like she inspired me to not play any games, you know what I'm saying, and not try and be cool and just capture her. And that was my only shoot, I feel like, in a way that's really like that. So for the kids to be so attached to it, I'm like, you know, I definitely believe in feeling my way around in life as well, though, you know? And I think that's a classic version of that happening. Cool. Cool. Vicky, anything you want to wrap up with? Uh, I no, know. I just think, um, you know, I'm, I just personally have been a fan of the three people, you know, that we're interviewing here in the room. Mm-hmm. And, you know, doing this book and doing this project and and just seeing, you know, the camaraderie amongst the documentarians of hip hop. And it's just been a really, really great. Most everybody's been really positive about. Yeah. 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 And they, you know, and they recognize each other's work. And it's it's um, for the most part, you know, they realize that they were part of this building this this big narrative so it's just been really really great and you know i'm looking forward to the book and traveling the exhibition and is there a a publishing date yet or is that too far out it's October 2018. October, so about a year from now. Oh, yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. right. Well, we'll do a we'll do an encore presentation. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, Thank you. Yeah. 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 (laughs) Cool. All right. Okay, that's another show for the history books. By the way, if you like the history of uh, music and photography, don't forget to check out the podcast we did with Lynn Goldsmith, which is a terrific, terrific show. Um, If you want to see additional visual content pertaining to today's show, you can visit the following sites. We have... Uh, JeanetteBeckman.com. We have DannyHastingsPhotography.com, upstairs at Erics.org, and ContactHighProject.com. You guys want to throw anything else into that? Where are you going to be? Where are you showing stuff? New okay. things coming up? We were talking earlier about the um, in regards to people ripping off your stuff and putting on T-shirts and things like that. So basically, we flip from being offered deals to. Um, put our images on things to starting our own company, apparel company. And so we are starting a big launch with the images of the Notorious B.I.G. and Faith from the Biggie's estate. It's all official. Everything's cool. And we were doing something with the Lee as well. But, um, yeah, so I met this really great designer in Berlin, Stefano Plotti, who's doing the design. And we're collaborating with him and Biggie's estate. And then ultimately we're going to put out a lot of other fun visuals. So... That sounds cool. I'm pretty psyched about that. Is there, is the brand have a name? Yes, yeah, upstairs at Eric's. There you go. Upstairs at Eric's is the clothing brand, and um, will a lot of that stuff is pretty much designed and sampled up now. It's gonna gonna be beyond like just t-shirts and hoodies and things that, but it's gonna be really officially designed fashion clothing. So that's gonna be coming out in the new year. Cool. Sounds great. Cool. Nice, Danny. Um, you could check me on Instagram, Danny Hastings. Um, and uh, I'm finishing my second feature. I do comedy. <laughs> nice. I do comedy film. I'm I'm really into uh, the whole digital filming uh, evolution. Uh, I'm really enjoying the the fact that you don't have to wait for people to give you money. You could just do it yourself. You know, um, with with a camera. Right now, I have ev- all the facilities. I have the digital camera, the editing bay, the studio, and we're just we're making movies, man. And my dream back then was to have a movie in the movie theaters. My dream today is to have people watch my movie <laughs> in the cell phone. <laughs> I, if I have two million people watching my movie in the cell phone, that's a dream come true. Like you know, it's it's evolving mm-hmm. to that. So check me on Instagram, Danny Hastings. You'll see. What's coming? Cool. I have a exhibition on November 3rd opening at 212 Arts, which is on Avenue B and 4th Street in the East Village. And it's um, hip-hop screen prints, legends of hip-hop. And I've kind of arted up my old archive and they look really different and they're looking pretty beautiful and there's a box oh, set you can buy and... So I'm excited about that. They're, That's the prints? Up. They're screen prints? They're screen prints. I'm oh, working wow. with this guy, Gary Lichtenstein Editions, out in Jersey City, and oh. we're making – it's an it's edition, so. Cool. How, how big are Check they? Out. Out. Um, some of them are like 30 by 40, and some of them are 11 by 14. So cool. So something for everybody. Nice. Sounds cool. Yeah. Would cool. you have like the some of the Clash stuff in there? 
No, I haven't gotten around to the punk stuff yet. Mm, That's the boy, next edition. Right now, it's <laughs> just it's just strictly hip hop at this oh, okay. this round. And your yeah. books and stuff, everything can be found for your web through your website. Is that the best um, way to find yeah, stuff? Yeah, most or? of my books are sold out, but yeah. you know, obviously, follow me, Jeanette Photo, on Instagram. Okay, that's it. There you Great. go. Instagram's the way. All right. Thank you so much. Okay, well, awesome, awesome show. Thank you, Vicky. Thank you, Jeanette. Thank you, Danny. Thank you, Eric. Thank you, Jason Tables and John Harris, as always. And thank you all so much for tuning in today.